What is the minimum depth of working space in front of electrical equipment? Rated 1200 amps, 480 slash 277 volt with exposed live parts on both sides of the working space. And the correct answer to this one is four feet. And for this one, we're going to head to 110.26a. Now, everything that we're doing in the code is we are first protecting the people and then the property. The people first and then the property. And if done correctly, we can. it's harmonious. And for this one, we're going to head to 110.26. But before we jump into the table of 110.26a, I want to make a clarification here. It's a big misnomer that only electrical equipment that is going to be worked on while energized is required to have the working space. And that's partly true. If it's required or if it's likely to be worked on while energized, it's required to have the working space dictated in 110.26a. But did you know that all electrical equipment is required to have working space and access? Let's go back to the beginning in 110.26. It says, access and working space shall be provided and maintained about all electrical equipment. And at that point, it doesn't give any dimensions yet. But you have to be able to access all electrical equipment because you might need to work on it. Now, it may be one of those pieces of equipment that truly are going to be de-energized and it doesn't need to meet the working space in 110.26a like we're getting ready to learn. But it's still required to have a uh, working space, electrical working space. Now, let's dive in and answer our question for today. And for this one, we're going to head to table 110.26a. And this is going to be one of my favorite tables because it's so simple to read. On the left-hand side is going to be our nominal voltage to ground. Across the top is going to be depending on our condition. And then here, when we tee off with those two items, we're going to find how many feet of working space we're required to have. Let's go ahead and answer our question for today. First, let's start with our nominal voltage to ground. Well, ours was 480 slash 277, but we're only going to be working with that lower number because that is our highest voltage to ground in this case. So we're going to come here and it's going to fall into this middle column. It's if you're in between 151 volts and 600 volts. Then we need to come deal with this condition business. Now down at the bottom is going to list your conditions below this table. Condition one is if there's exposed live parts on one side. Condition two is if there's exposed live parts on one side and there are grounded parts on the other side, like a block wall or something like that. And then condition three is going to be if there are exposed live parts on both sides. So this one, we need to first come to our nominal voltage, which is the middle column. Then we need to slide all the way over to condition three. And that's where we're going to find this four foot requirement. What is the maximum distance allowed between receptacles in a residential dwelling unit's kitchen countertop area? And the correct answer is four feet. And for this one, we're going to head to 210.52C1. And this is where we're going to learn all about the requirements for kitchen countertops and in the 2017 and later kitchen work surfaces. So whether you are dealing with a kitchen countertop by definition or a kitchen work surface, this is how you're going to space your receptacle outlets in those areas. Let's dive into the code. When we get there, we find out that receptacle outlets shall be installed on work surfaces or countertops that are 12 inches or wider. So the first question we're going to ask ourselves is this countertop 12 inches wide? If it is or wider, we know that we're going to have at least one receptacle outlet servicing that countertop. Now let's read on. It says receptacle outlets must be installed so that no point along the wall line is greater than 24 inches, more than 24 inches. Let's see what it's saying. You can pick either side of this countertop, starting with the sink here or over here to the right. And we're going to start with our first two foot measurement. So from the edge over two feet, we have to have our first receptacle within that first two feet. Then we're allowed to go up to four feet after that, just so that no point measured anywhere is going to be greater than two feet if you measure it. Then we need to wrap around this corner, and we also need to finish within two foot of this sink right here in this specific scenario. 
And what the purpose of this is, is so you can plug in an appliance with a two foot cord and you should be able to plug it in basically anywhere that you set it down. The beauty of this is, is it keeps homeowners or the general public from using extension cords. And that's what we want to try to avoid at all costs. And really that's the purpose of all receptacle spacing in the NEC is to keep us, even me, from using extension cords. I've probably got one around here that I may or may not should be using. But the whole point is, is we want to avoid that as much as possible. According to the NEC, what is the requirement for the number of receptacle outlets in a bathroom in dwelling units? And the correct answer is D. At least one receptacle outlet must be installed within three feet of each basin. And for this one, we're going to head to 210.52D. Now, when we get to 210.52, that's going to lay out the spacing requirements for almost every receptacle that you can imagine in a dwelling unit. And for this one, let's dive to the paraphrase code language. A minimum of one receptacle outlet must be installed in bathrooms within three feet of the outer edge of each basin. The outlet should be positioned on a wall or partition that is next to the basin or basin countertop or on the countertop itself or on the side or front of the basin cabinet. Now let's stop right there and then we'll finish reading it here in just a moment. What this is saying is within three foot of the edge of that basin, I'm imagining that somewhere on this vanity, the basin starts here and you can just continue whether you're on the left or right side, anywhere in that three foot zone and you could draw an arch across it, anywhere in that zone that receptacle is allowed to be placed. If we have multiple basins, that measurement starts all over again. We are allowed to strategically place one outlet to satisfy the three feet for both basins. That's okay. Because here it says three feet of the outer edge of each basin. So it doesn't say we have to have one outlet per, but it says that we must have an outlet within three feet of each basin. And this is to keep people, again, like we learned yesterday, from running extension cords, especially in bathrooms. Now let's finish reading the code. The outlet must not be placed more than 12 inches below the top of the basin or basin countertop. So we can't be 12 below 12 inches there. And then let's talk about this third part here. It says receptacle outlet assemblies that are approved for countertop use are allowed to be physically installed in the countertop, like a pop-up or something like that. Now you have to be careful with this last part here. There are two different major type of listings for these receptacles that are in like the pop-up receptacles. There are some that are listed for work surfaces and there, there are some that are listed for countertops. You are going to have to have the one that is listed for a countertop if you're wanting to install it in like a kitchen island or a kitchen countertop or in the bathroom countertop. It cannot be the one listed for work surfaces. There is a time and a place for that, but it's not around heavy water usage here. According to the NEC, is EMT permitted to be used as an equipment grounding conductor? And of course, what we're talking about here is using the conduit itself as an equipment grounding conductor instead of a wire type equipment grounding conductor. And the correct answer is yes. Now let's break down the scenario. Let's imagine that you have a friend that owns this commercial shop. She gives you a call. She says, hey, I've got one light over my cash register. Could you potentially install me another one? And you're like, sure, I can do it. You drive over there, you pull out a stick of EMT, you pipe it over, you go ahead and get ready to hang the light. In the meantime, you realize that you don't have a roll of green on the truck and you call me and you say, coach, can I install this light with no wire type equipment grounding conductor in the conduit? And the correct answer is yes. And we're going to have to go to a couple different code sections for this. And just to make sure that I'm being clear, just so you understand from this light on the, well, I think it'd be my left-hand side over to the new light, whatever side it's on as you're looking at it from the screen. As you go from this side to that side, you could potentially just run a hot and a neutral over there and use that equipment, or excuse me, use the EMT itself as an equipment grounding conductor. Let's go ahead and take a look at it here. EMT, electrical metallic tubing, is permitted to be used as an equipment grounding conductor as specified in 358.60 and in 250.118. Now, when we get over to 358.60, it is the 
NEC article all about EMT. If you want to learn everything you ever needed to know about installing it, you could go over to EMT. It'll tell you use is permitted, use is not permitted. It'll tell you about securing and supporting. And when you get to dot 60, it just says flat out EMT can be used as an equipment grounding conductor. And where this code really derives from is back in 250.118, where there is a very long laundry list of items that are allowed to be used as equipment grounding conductors. Let's look at the paraphrase code language here it says the equipment grounding conductor either accompanied or excuse me my eyes i just got them worked on either accompanied or enclosed this with the circuit conductors must be one or more of the following types the first one is a conductor made of copper aluminum or copper clad aluminum this conductor can be solid stranded insulated covered or bare and can take the form of a wire or bus bar of any shape. So that's the one that we're most familiar with. It's called a wire type or a bus type equipment grounding conductor. The one that we're most familiar with is a wire type, uh, the green stranded bare solid wire that you install with your circuits to act as the equipment grounding conductor. That's the one that we're most familiar with. I've only pulled five from this list, but it is a very long list of things that you might be surprised you can use as an equipment grounding conductor in lieu of a wire type. The second one is rigid metal conduit. The third one is inter intermediate metal conduit. And the one that we're talking about today is electrical metallic tubing, EMT. And then it goes on to talk about listed, listed flexible metal and a bunch of other ones, but most of the rest of this list has special parameters that you're allowed to use or that you must abide by if you're wanting to use this as an equipment grounding conductor. So don't just think you're going to pull out some liquid FET flex and use it without meeting the other requirements that are listed there in 250.118. So you are allowed to use EMT as an equipment grounding conductor itself. Now, often types, I'm all about pulling a wire type equipment grounding conductor on top of my EMT. I like to do both just for many reasons, in my opinion. And don't forget that there are specific cases in the NEC where you must pull a wire type equipment grounding conductor. I think there's some rules in HVAC. Um, in certain scenarios that you must have a wire type equipment grounding conductor. There are other pieces of equipment in the NEC that require or, or just the manufacturer specs that require a wire type equipment grounding conductor. I'm not going to get in the business of doing a lot of using rigid metal or EMT as my equipment grounding conductor. Although if done safely and properly, there's absolutely nothing wrong with it. I am the electrical code coach and my bargain is that these videos will add value to you and you will in turn add value to others. If you ever need anything from me, you can always just email me at electricalcodecoach at gmail.com. Let's get to it. Hey everyone, welcome back. I am the Electrical Code Coach, and this is the electrical question of the day. What is the maximum height of a main breaker handle above the floor or working platform when it's in its highest position? And the correct answer is six feet, seven inches. Now let's just imagine for a second that you've had a customer call you and they want you to come out and give them an estimate on doing a panel change. You give them the estimate, they're excited, they say yes, they've got an old nasty Federal Pacific in this bedroom and they're gonna contract you to change it out. Well, when you get there on that day, you see, hey, the main breaker here at this height, no big deal, it's a little bit smaller panel and they've set it a little bit lower. Well, when you get your new panel, nice 40 circuit panel, you find out that it's a whole lot bigger and that main breaker is going to be much higher than the previous main breaker. The question today is how high can that main breaker be located off the floor legally? Well, the correct answer is six foot seven, like we learned. So you're like, let's imagine in this situation that it's going to end up being six foot nine, this main breaker, because these new panels are so large and your hole coming in the back is dictating kind of the height of that panel based off of the outside equipment. Happens all the time. So you decide that you're going to flip this panel upside down and put your main breaker on the bottom. Not a problem. As long as the breaker goes from left to right, then you're okay. It cannot ever be installed that if it's an up and down breaker, that it's in the off position while it's up. 
But if you have a side to side breaker, you can likely flip that panel upside down and use it with the main breaker on the bottom. But the question is, am I good to go? Do I have any other considerations for this specific code? And the answer is you do. We are not just in the clear. I put the word main breaker in today's question on purpose because it's a big misnomer in our industry that the main breaker is not allowed to be higher than six foot seven. And that's true, not allowed to be higher than six foot seven. But did you know that every overcurrent device in that panel is not allowed to be over six foot seven? As a matter of fact, there are no overcurrent devices that are allowed to be installed above six foot seven unless they're in one of the conditions that are listed below in the code that we're getting ready to cover. Let's look at the paraphrase code language. It says circuit breakers and switches with fuses must be readily accessible and installed so that the center of the operating handle is no more than six foot seven inches above the floor or working platform, unless one of the following exceptions apply. And there are a few exceptions down below, and usually it has to do with supplementary overcurrent protection. So let's imagine you had a piece of equipment and it also had a localized disconnect right there next to the equipment. As long as the, the, the breaker that's feeding that branch circuit is lower than six foot seven and accessible, then it's okay because you can turn it off at a readily accessible location. Then up there, if you want to have another breaker or fuse, that's likely going to be okay. And that's one of the scenarios where you are allowed to do it. But just as a blanket statement, under most circumstances, all of your circuit breakers are going to need need to be below six foot seven. So just keep that in mind. And in my opinion, like in this scenario today, if you flip that panel upside down and let's say you're not even using those unused spaces and you use all of these lower spaces closer to the main breaker and you're like, oh, none of the breakers I've installed today are over six foot seven. If I'm your inspector, I'm going to say that includes also any of the available breaker spaces because we know in the future when someone pulls a circuit in from the top, it is going to like they're likely going to use one of the the one of the ones closer to the top because it's easier it's safer to wire there's not a bunch of wires in their way so just keep that in mind when you're out in the field now that will be subject to your ahj and how they handle things i am the electrical code coach and my bargain is that these videos will add value to you and you will in turn add value to others if there's anything you ever need from me you can always just email me at electricalcodecoach at gmail.com. If you're enjoying these videos and you want to see some specific topics that we talk about or make these questions about, you can just drop it down in the comments below and I will check them out. If you need anything from me, just give me a shout. Let's get to it.